Um, we took them out to about 1350 on average per unit. So that was, um, that was great. Our expenses stayed the same. Our rents went way up. Actually, our expenses went down because we properly managed it. Um, and uh, let's see. So that was that was the first property. And then what else? And then I picked up a 26 unit, a 15 unit, and an 11 unit over the next couple of years. And we did the same thing. I mean, we just renovated units. We did cheap renovations. We put in like, you know, we always take carpet out. We put in LEP floors. I always get them at Wood Floors Plus and Glen Burnie because you can get them on sale. Uh, we buy our cabinets at Castle Wholesalers. And we basically will turn a unit and make it a brand new unit for like eight grand with new floors, new kitchen, new appliances, update the bathrooms, new light fixtures, new paint. Um, and a lot of times we can get anywhere from three to $600 more a month in rent. So that's, that's kind of what it is. Now I'm just looking for more deals. I'm at about 121 units right now. I'd love to get to three or 400 units. So hopefully the next few years will be fruitful. That's the plan. Outstanding. So this is Nicole. Plan. You told me once when we were having lunch, um, that one of the things you found pretty helpful or that you changed a lot was how you dealt with managers, property managers. Yeah. You want to tell me a couple of couple of the other people, a couple of stories about what you told me about property managers? I okay. So I learned this from you, which was so, 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 so profitable. It was awesome. It was the coolest thing I had learned. Uh well, what I learned a lot of cool things, but this was definitely one of the most the, the greatest one of the greatest gifts that you had given me. Um, and by the way, thank you so much because the amount that I paid for your course, I probably got back like 5,000 fold, if not more. So thank you. Wow. <laughs> so you're just going to have to pass it along, you know, pass it forward at some point. Yeah. If I, I don't know if I could do it as well as you can, but I'll, if I can do it 5% as well as you can, I feel like I'll be a success. Oh, Alex. You you know that you are so good at everything. You got such good no, people skills no, that no, no. I've had, just I've, put I've, me I've in I've the had my fair share of goof ups. Um, so oh, so one of the things that um, so Nicole has a whole module in property management, and she was like, "You've got to incent, you've got to line up the incentives uh, of the property manager. Uh, you got to line up incentives so they're incentivized to make you more money, basically." So a lot of management companies, they'll they'll charge you for new leases, but they don't really bill for renewals. So they're incentivized to keep turning tenants. Um, and Nicole was like, well, incentivized for keeping uh, keeping tenants and incentivized for rent increases. So uh, with this property, at first I thought we could manage it ourselves, but then I met this lady who actually used to manage that building. Um, and... I hired her as the property manager um, and she was like, no, there's the rents are tapped out. You can't go higher in rents. These people can't pay more. You're already high for the area. So I came up with a, this. This was Nicole's idea that I implemented. And I said, hey, um, for every time you increase rent, say you increase rents by $100, um, you got a hundred dollar bonus. If you increase rents by 300 bucks, you got a $300 bonus on top of everything she was getting paid. And at first, before, before I said that, the rents were not going up. She was like, oh, no, these people can't pay more. All of a sudden, our rents on that building went from like over, this is over the course of a few years, but we went from a rent roll of like maybe $280,000 to over $500,000. That's huge. <laughs> it was, it was great. I mean, it was, our expenses stayed the same. People are renewing and somehow, some I don't know how, but those rents went up, even though at first she thought we were tapped out until we incentivized and we weren't tapped out anymore. So now I think, I think now we are at the top of the market um, for that building and for everything else, we're slowly 
Um, like I bought an 11 unit in Windsor Mill, uh, 11 townhomes. Um, and that was also off a cold call. Um, and those rents were 1,040 a unit. And guess what we're, when tenants leave and we do, uh, uh, we update the units. I spend, you know, eight grand maybe updating units, new kitchen cabinets, new appliances, new flooring, maybe a new vanity, some light fixtures, maybe eight, 10,000 bucks max. We're taking those rents from 1,040 on average to 1695. Wow. 60%, 60% bump. And that's 60. So that, that reno, I whatever I spent on the reno, I basically get back in like a little over 12 months. That's a fantastic ROI. And then from then on, it's profit. And for every, what is that? For every, uh, the, the beautiful thing on commercial real estate is it's not based on comps. It's based on your net operating income. So every time we can add $10,000 of um, net operating income, what is that? What does that do on a stuff is selling? What is a six cap, seven cap these days? What is it, probably a six cap in this yeah. area, right? Yeah, cap rates are going up. So, so that's any, their average or seven and a half to eight now because they're they mimic the interest rates a, a little bit more. So so cap rates are going up. Which I mean, so, yeah, but interest it rates may are not be stable. in Washington D.C. and stuff, but you know, so if we only at a six cap. I don't mean to interrupt here, but if you're only no. at a six cap, the cost of money is six and a half to seven. So you're, you are actually, you know, I always try and be ahead of the cost yeah. of, of money in terms of the cap rates I buy at. So Nicole, let me ask you this. Um, do you think, cause interest rates are starting to, um, interest rates are starting to, sorry, my hands are, I was playing with paint and now I've got paint on my hands. So I apologize. I don't want people to think that I have like nail polish or something weird. I thought uh, you would hit your finger with a hammer. Thing, no, I, I, I don't know how to play with all those tools. I, but I, I was trying to, I'm really good at hitting curbs with my car when I park. So I was trying to touch up the paint <laughs> on my car wheels. And apparently the stuff is stains a lot and it doesn't come out. So that was that was my 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 lesson learned of trying to do something myself that I probably should have no business doing. <laughs> so interest yeah. rates are starting to come down. That you're right, but but do you um, think cap rates have really even caught up? even Fannie and Freddie and the Fed are kind of saying that they're going to stay. They're not going to come down. Okay, as much but as your we take is have cap rates are, are the interest rates already fully like in, encapsulated and what the cap rates are or are cap rates still trending up even though interest rates are staying, staying flat? Interest rates are kind of coming down, but so they they tend to, the interest rate and the cap rate um, tend to, or the um, inflation rates and um, interest rates and stuff like that, they, they all cap rates and those tend to, well, let me kind of say that. So the mortgage rates and the um, and the interest rates tend to move in the same direction, but they are not linked to each other directly. So mortgage interest rates are a little bit different than um, than what you see in terms of of overall inflation rates and stuff like that. So, so let me ask you this. Um, your and opinion. actually, we went in December, it was 3.1%. And I'm sorry, yeah. And in January, it was 3.4% um, in terms of inflation on a monthly basis. So that's one of the reasons the Fed is being a little bit more cautious um, yeah. about, you know, cutting rates more. And so I don't know, but I just did a um, social media post probably a couple of weeks ago on um, where people are saying the um, they think the interest rates are going to end up this year. And it's in the high fives, low sixes on average. And that's for people of good credit. So say that they stay there. Say that they Not stay in the there. long Do you run. Do think cap rates are going to continue to climb or... Or are they kind of just going to stay where they're at? 
Um, I think they're, they are probably going to be, I'm seeing a lot of things showing up at an eight cap, seven and a half to an eight. Really? And so um, they Where? may stay there for a little bit. I don't think they're going to go to nines and tens. But if you think about it, um, you know, that that property. So what did you say? I'm just going to kind of look here and just kind of do a quick calculation. So you said how much the the um, property is is worth that you were talking so say, about. Say say, say that we take a unit up six hundred bucks. Our expenses stay the same, right? Because the expenses are the expenses. Where so you... what is your NOI? Give me an NOI. So, so, let's, the, and, so let's say I'm just going to say like okay, say we add seventy two hundred dollars a year to NOI. What does that translate in value? Is this per unit or is this per per unit per, per unit? 7200 how many units uh let's say that this this is an 11 th this this is like a little 11 unit in windsor mill 11 little town homes all right so that's about seventy nine thousand dollars. and so if we were to look at what it's worth at a at a six six cap rates it's 1.32 million yeah, so that's one point. Let's say it's at, at an eight cap. That's nine hundred ninety thousand. So by investing eight to ten thousand dollars a unit times eleven units, so that's like by investing a hundred grand, you get back a million dollars of value. Yes. Only in commercial real estate. Yeah, that's Where else the, are you gonna the do overall. That? Yeah, that's the overall. I mean, you're not going to see that much increase, but you're certainly going to be at you know, 80 to 90% um, return on your investment within a year. Which is fantastic. Which is, you where, know, where, you else you gonna, where, where, it, where else are you going to get that? Yeah, I totally agree with that. You know, even 20%. I, I used to, when interest rates were really low, I used to lend hard money out at 7%. Woo! You know, because... We're like, we're, you know, we're, what are we going to do? We're not going to pay these mortgages down at 3%. Oh, yeah. You know, you can't put money on a CD. Maybe you'll get 1.5% on a CD. I will take, I'll say any day, I'll take higher interest rates over low interest rates because when the interest rates were low, the market went nuts. It went ballistic. And I'd rather mean, buy it. You mean in terms low. of people buying things? Yeah, you I, you could you could always refinance. Yeah, there's prepayment penalties and all that, but this is what I always tell my my real estate clients. You can always refinance your interest rate, you cannot refinance your purchase price. Yeah. And you're much more likely to get a better purchase price when the interest rates are higher. And there's three ways to really increase the value of a property. That's through increasing income, decreasing expenses, and changing the financing on a property. So, you know, yeah. those are the three ways you kind of make you, those are about the only three ways you have to really um, drive the value of a property. I think Michael Hawkins has his hand up. What's up, Michael? I don't know how to. No, no, no. Thanks, Alex. And, and uh, Thank you. My... So I want to thank James for inviting me and, and uh, all, all the nice things he's done in our short period of time and knowing each other. But no, your story, Alex, you know, I can definitely resonate with it. Uh, I just want to pass on a nugget. Uh, so one of the things I look at when tracking interest rates versus cap rates, you track the SOFR and you track the seven, and, well, let's say five, seven and 10 year treasury. Um, and what's interesting is if you look at the uh, SOFR, the SOFR stands for secured overnight financing rate. It's like uh, the old, the, 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 there used to be something else. And then the SOFA came around. What was the old SOFA? LIBOR. LIBOR. Yes. LIBOR. You're right, right, right. So, I mean, it's really just a good indicator. Like, you know, we kind of track that on a, on a almost a daily basis. Like what I do is I just look at the 10-year treasury and I always calculate 250 basis points. And that's normally what on, let's say, on a very close average, at what you're going to get for, let's say, um, you know, debt, you know, agency debt, right? So, um, you know, a lot of times, you know, the, the cap rates, you know, is definitely different in every market, but, you know, you try to follow that and that kind of gives you an indicator of how to track it across different regions and, you know, just know where the baseline is. So 
Um, but very good nuggets. I just wanted to just drop that because I, I want to chime. I don't, don't want to take your uh, your momentum away. So no, 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 Michael. Well, uh, I, I I took a because you're I like your hat by the way. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I I took your because you had your number and your your thing. I took your number down, so I'll hit you up a little. I'll hit you up a little later. That's please awesome. Do. Please do, please do. Awesome. No, it's like, that's a great that's a great point. I like the cigar too, man. This guy's living, dude. Well, well, we will talk offline, but this All is what right. I do. I'm, I have a bunch of calls tonight, so it's what I do. I just kind of blend the cigar thing with uh, real estate calls and just 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 run through them. So you got the right idea. So you should have a brandy in your left hand to go along with that cigar yeah. in your right. A whiskey, <laughs> and it's coming towards whiskey? the end of the night. A whiskey. All right. <laughs> Awesome. A little bourbon. Burp, so so bourbon is whiskey. So <laughs> scotch is all. Is all I, I show my ignorance. Is all whiskey are all bourbons whiskeys or is all whiskey bourbons? So all bourbons are whiskeys, but all whiskeys are not bourbons. You have Canadian, whiskey, Irish whiskey. You have Scotch, which is Scottish uh, whiskey. And, and I have a um, the last thing I'll say. I'm, I'm taking up too much time, but. <laughs> Uh, whiskey, I'll, I'll test everyone. So, whiskey spelled two different ways. Which which type of whiskey is spelled with an e and with a y at the uh, a y? So, whiskey, W H I S K Y is one way to spell it. W H I S K E Y is another way to spell it. So, yeah. I'll lay that out there, and that may be a, a lightning round question for maybe next week. Okay. I did not know that. I did not know that. So one of the things I, I do tell people a lot, and I think James will support this, and so will um, Jane and Sharon and hopefully Alex, is <clears throat> that um, <clears throat> it's important in commercial real estate, it's important to buy right all the time, but in the long run, it's more important to manage right. Yeah, because it, it's how you manage that increases the value of your property, like we just talked about, like how, like updating units, like updating rents, like keeping your um, your expenses under control. I mean, those are the things that really drive the value. Keeping residents, so your single biggest controllable expense is tenant turnover. Mm -hmm. Every time a tenant turns over, you have lost a month or two of income on that unit. At least. And I, so I don't know about your tenants, but my tenants destroy the places. I don't know what they do, but anytime well, I get a unit back. I would say you probably need to do a little more often um, kind of preventive maintenance checks and keep yeah. and do, you know, so we do move in, move out checklists. And I mean, then they, quarterly they we go around and fix something and we go with that checklist to make sure I don't, the the maintenance people yeah. do, to try and make sure that they're maintaining those units. And that's in our lease as a reason to be evicted if they don't maintain those units. So, but you're right. They really that's can. Smart. That's the probably, average that's probably length of a tenant across somebody. the country is about a year and ours are running four to five years. Be, uh, the average turnover so it makes a really really big difference how you treat those residents it makes a huge difference in your bottom line i think pardon it makes a huge difference in your bottom line it sure does if you get if you get tenants to stay but i, I gotta i gotta yeah that that's a good idea to to pay somebody a little extra and just have them go through all the units just if you let me know, you I'll send you, I'll send you our our quarterly uh, maintenance checklist or or preventive maintenance checklist and what we do each quarter. Okay. So we also we sell it by saying we'll come in and we'll fix little things, we'll change out your furnace filters, we'll do this, we'll do that. So um, and with the what we're really trying to do is a maintain the unit and b make sure that somebody isn't destroying our unit. I got to see your lease clause, which says if they're not maintaining it properly, that's grounds for uh, giving them the boot. Yep. 
Good for you. Thank I'm you. I'm going to turn my all, mute off. I'm sorry for keep interrupting, Alex. No, no, no. I I don't have much to say. You're you're the one with all the knowledge. I'm just. Uh, I, I will say, Nicole, thank you so much for what you taught me because just off that first building alone, I think that first building alone, like I still work and I still sell real estate because I really like it. And I'm buying more stuff because I enjoy it. But just that first building alone, I think, covers all of my living expenses. Not that, you know, I live extravagantly or anything like that, but what one one deal. Thank you. All right, that's really great. That's really one great. Transaction. We've got a hand and up one, there. One Alex. nugget in terms of raising rents, two hundred thousand dollars added to the bottom line, more than two hundred thousand because of that one little nugget. of incentive uh, lining up the incentives. I think Rita has a question. Or at least I think it's Rita. She had her hand up. Uh, Rita, you can just unmute if you have a question. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. I have a question, but offline, I don't know what happened if my hand raised. I'm sorry about that. Okay, I may have been, there was somebody who's showing a Y on their avatar Not, who was raising their hand. I think she it was, was young. Clapping. She was clapping. About oh. The, oh. The, the Nicole did that, that for Alex. Thank you, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I would clap for James and Nicole. They're the ones that taught me this stuff. I, yeah. was, I was buying all single units before this. So for the, the people that are newer, right, you're, um, you're, you've been a realtor for a very long time and obviously been in the business. Do people have to be a realtor to, um, to get, be an investor in real estate? Does it help? Does it hinder? Does it matter? Not at all. I mean, I started as a realtor when I was 18, so I had no clients. Nobody trusted me because I was so young. I used to lie about my age and people were like, oh, you look young. I'm like, oh, I'm 23. When I was like 18, they're, they're like, 23, you're so young. I'm like, oh my God. Um, no, I think the only skill that really translated was uh, because when I started, I, I didn't have a family member in the business. I had no way of getting leads. So I'd cold call. Um, and I would cold call in order to get listings to make like a $6,000 commission. So I'd call like 50 people, get like five appointments, go on five appointments, sell one or two homes out of that, you know, to make like five grand, six grand, seven grand, four grand. It was, I mean, it was a pain. And I was doing that when I was going to classes and trying to party and all that other stuff that all that stupid stuff that you do when you're, 19 and 20 and 18 and whatever but um i will say that's the only skill that translated uh because i was so comfortable just talking to random people about nothing and getting hung up on that you know i cold called for apartment buildings and the returns are obviously so much better on that um so i would just dial and they'd be like how the hell did you get my number i'm like off the effing internet sir <laughs> do you want to sell your building and they'd be like no take me off your calling list i'd be like all right have a great night next and then i'd call them back and then i'd call them back and i just bother them and then they'd be like all right let's meet yeah i'm tired of managing this thing let's let's do it i mean i haven't bought that many deals or anything like that but i will say that's the only skill that translated um yeah other than that i don't think it really no being a realtor doesn't really do anything doesn't yeah and what about um do you have to go into single family first would you knowing what you know now about multifamily would you have still done single family and if you would great you know i'm just curious no i mean i think if you get the right education i mean the first multifamily building i bought when i was 20 years old i bought with a partner and that was a disaster because i had no education mm -hmm. i think if you get the education then it's it's a very simple business to run compared to the businesses that people run. It's a very simple business to run. It's not a, it's not a completely passive investment. Like if you buy an annuity, but your returns are, can be so much better if you're, if you're hands-on, but it's not a business like you're running a restaurant or you're running, I don't even know, like a daycare or something where you have to 
pay attention every day. Mm -hmm. Like um, I probably make the same or more money right now off my rentals than I do off my um, day-to-day business of selling real estate. And in terms of my work split, it's probably 10% rentals, 90% dealing with clients for their transactions. If, if I leave for three or four days and don't answer anybody on the rentals, nothing happens. If I don't answer my clients for three or four days, they go somewhere else. No, no. You know, you, or you run a restaurant, if you just don't serve people food and close the door, they might not come back. You know, so I think, I, I don't know. I, 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 I think long-term it's a great business. And and the nice thing is your expenses, your mortgage stays the same. Mm-hmm. Your your rent just just because of inflation. Even if you do, if you if, even if you do nothing to really increase rents or push rents up or, or add any sweat equity or whatever, the inflation over time will take your rents up as long as you're just keeping track of inflation. So, it like real estate is very forgiving as long as you can hang on to the property. And I feel like it's a, a it's very lucrative, especially over time. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of stuff that even on the singles that I bought, I mean, my first property that I bought, I think, you know, I was getting like a thousand dollars a month in rent. And now it's 17 or 1800. And that's, that's just the market. That's with me doing nothing. That's with that property now being 12 years, 13 years older than it is. So it's actually in worse condition. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm sure in another 10 years, it'll just could be even better. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't know I, if I see a good deal on a single family house or a townhouse mm-hmm. or something, I'll still buy it. Right. But the, 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 there's so much more scalability in multifamily. Right. Makes sense. Makes total sense. Does anybody have any questions for Alex? He's a wealth of information or Nicole. I don't know about all that, but yeah. <laughs> uh, I have a question. Mm-hmm. Uh, what type of financing have you used? In a, did you use in the beginning? Um, in terms of the apartment buildings, in terms of multifamily. Yes. Uh, um, the first first deal was a a a, a, fa- a a Freddie Mac small balance multifamily loan. Um, so small balance loan is anywhere I think between one million and five million dollars. The underwriting is not that stringent. I think after 5 million bucks, the underwriting is more stringent. Um, interest rates are great. It's non-recourse financing, which means if you if you screw up, they can't go after you personally unless you like really do something bad and like commit fraud and all that. Um, that was the first deal. Uh, the second deal was a, my second deal was the 11 unit townhome complex. Um, it ended up being too small for uh, a Freddie Mac loan, I think. Uh, so that one West Banco financed for me. Um, third deal was a 15 unit. That one was also West Banco. And the fourth deal was uh, Virginia Partners Bank, which is a, um, which is a uh, now, uh, now they sold to Link Bank, but I mean the the, the banks really look at your uh, at the building financials, and I've always gone to the sellers and I'm like, hey, look, this is what you know, this is the bank criteria. So whatever you send me, I'll send to the bank. But this is what they look for. So somehow whatever they sent me, always and for smaller for investors, like for new investors, uh, what I would mean, you? I, I I was a smaller investor. I think. I right. mean, it's it, yeah. If you're, I mean, if you're looking for, if you're looking for, it it depends. If you're buying singles, then then any mortgage broker. Um, if you can justify that you're buying it as a prim- primary residence, of course you get better interest rates. Right. But in terms of in terms of um, multifamily, the regional banks. I think are the are the best and you can always partner with people you can always you know go to a friend and say hey i've got this good deal um you know if you put up the 
the the down payment and the equity, I'll give you 50% of the upside. I'll, I'll do all the work. Okay. And so you Thank don't you. Really necessarily have to have a lot of cash. And, and the, 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 the smaller, the, the business banks, like the regional banks, they'll, they don't care if you have partners and stuff like that. They just want to make sure the property cash flows, I think, usually. Okay. Thanks. Have you ever used Section 8 for your single family homes? And if you did, what do you think about it? I love Section 8. So you have? My single, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love Section 8. Um, I think probably 30% of my tenants are Section 8. Okay. Um, oh, so Section 8 you can use in for multi-family as well? Oh, 100%. Okay. I thought it was just for single family. No, 100%. You can use them from, you can use Section 8 for multi-family. They'll usually ask you, they don't want you to charge more than you charge your market rate tenants. But if you have, say, so they'll ask you for three comps in your complex. So say your apartments are going for 1400 and you try to charge 1600 because the because Section 8 will pay that. They'll say, okay, show us three apartments that are similar in your complex that are the same you know, bedroom count or whatever that you're getting 1600 on. Um, so they'll do that check, which they really don't on, on single family. Uh, but yeah, I mean, shoot, we would go, a lot of people don't like section eight. I think if you screen, right. Uh, I, I love section eight. It's guaranteed income. They stay a long time. You got good, you know, good quality people. Um, Yeah, I think a third, a third of my third of the income comes from uh, from Section Eight. But probably thirty of the tenants are Section Eight. But on my single family, I will say this: on the apartments, the Section Eight tenants and the regular tenants usually leave the apartments in similar shape. On my single family homes, when I have a big family moving in with a lot of kids, man, people could be there for a year or two. I get the places back and I'm like, what the hell happened in here? Like you were only here for 13 months. Like why does, why are the cabinet doors ripped off? Why, why are there state, why, why is the floor ripped up? Like what the hell happened here? So yeah, sometimes on my, on my single family homes, especially the, the one. Yeah. I mean, we'll still do section eight because we get definitely more rent that way and the people most of the time i i don't care if i get a place back and it's ripped up and the tenant was there for seven or eight years but the ones that stay for a year and then move out and then we got to pay like six thousand dollars to fix it up and you know they've only been there for a year and then their security deposit doesn't cover anything and then of course you, you know you try to go back after them and you're like hey you owe us you know five grand you never got that money in my experience um but when they stay a while yeah but but yeah we we i, I love section eight i love section eight on apartments the most because usually you get um and I, I i wouldn't discriminate against like people with a lot of kids or anything like that i've got kids um but but sometimes in my single family homes the condition that we get those properties back from the section eight tenants are, is rough compared to the apartments. On the apartments, it's usually the same. You but I, I will say we get longer tenancy on Section 8, typically, especially on the apartments. Especially the single, not not that you're allowed to like discriminate or screen like against certain people. But if I, if I took like a snapshot, my older tenants that are single or a couple with no kids, they stay a long time and the property comes back clean. So most hey. of your tenants are section eight. What's that? Most of your tenants are section eight? No, probably about 30%. Okay. I was on there today on um, HUD.gov and you can actually find out what the fair market rent is for one bedrooms, two bedrooms, three bedrooms, et cetera. You just do a Google search and it'll pop up depending on what part they sectionize everything. So like, you know, Baltimore, Towson, Columbia is one section and then like DC is another section or whatever it is and get an idea of, okay, if I get a section eight, 
you know, this is about what they would pay. I think I think that um, number includes if you're including utilities. I think that's right. all in cost, if I'm not mm -hmm. mistaken. Yep. Oh, I was going to add. Um, so, no, great point about Section Eight. Um, so, I actually have a, I have uh, assets in, in different regions. So, every region handles Section Eight differently. Um, for example, Howard County, they call it uh, moderately priced dwellings (MPD). Mm -hmm. And normally, what they do is they let's say uh, a lot, maybe like thirty percent of the unit uh, mix for MPDs. And what they do is they have a very specific uh, formula. So maybe like 5% versus uh, some some type of calculation where you have to keep the rents kind of at a certain level. So um, you just have to know what region you're in, like like James was mentioning, you, you look it up on HUD, but you want to be just very clear on what the regulations are. If you have to do, for example, uh, inspections or regulations, you have to cover with um, having a Section 8 uh, type of unit. So I mean, it's a lot of a lot of things come come into it, but it can be very advantageous if you know what you're doing and you know how to balance that against your market rents and et cetera. So it's very 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 good stuff. Thank you. Yeah, Michael, that's that's so true. Like DC does their Section Eight, you could say, okay, I've got a three bedroom this this uh, subdivision. This is what you get, and that's what you charge, and then you go. I think Montgomery County, they'll say, oh, we got to run comps. And I think Prince George County does the same thing. And then Baltimore will give us, Baltimore County will give us the, 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 the you know, the max. Baltimore County, I love Baltimore County Section 8. And they actually respond. I love Baltimore County Section 8. We got like 2,500 bucks for like a, you know, dinky little four bedroom house, which on the market, if I was to rent it, I'd probably get like 1,700. So I don't even care if they tear up the house. <laughs> Stay there forever. Stay there forever. Tear up the house. Pass the inspections. I got I got I got a call today from uh, a Section Eight inspector for a house that we have got in Randallstown. So he inspected it. the The tenant took all of the smoke and carbon monoxide detectors down because I guess I don't know. I think they smoke weed in the house or something, and just you know. I mean, I, I don't care what people do as long as they don't bother the neighbors. Um, but the dude is like, and we can't reach the tenant. I'm like, did you, because these these carbon smoke detectors are like 60, 70 bucks a piece. He's like, you got to put all of them back. And I, and this is a 24 hour violation. I'm coming back tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. So I had to call a contract. I'm like, dude, can you go to Home Depot and overspend on these things? And hopefully the tenant is there and can tell us where the hell she put these damn smoke detectors. Um, but that house was rented for like 2,800 bucks. I don't think I'd get more than two grand if I was lucky, uh, on, on market rent. And that, that tenant has been there since like 2019, 2018. She's a little weird, but you know, we make six, 700 bucks, six, $700 extra a month. I'll, I'll, I'll deal with, with, uh, a little weird weirdness, you know, you get paid for it. Versus Montgomery County, they'll 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 run comps. They'll be like, oh well, these these units sold for rented for this much and this much, and that's the most that we're going to give you. So then you really got a screen. So I think we have time for about one more um, question, and then we're going to turn it back to um, to James to kind of wrap this up a little bit. So, um, so one of the times you and I, Alex, have to talk about tightening up your management for people who tear up your houses a little bit I, do I don't have it. that problem well do you that's why that's why you own eight thousand units and i own a hundred units <laughs> well it's just you know you do such incredible credible stuff but you know i kind of you know, if you have somebody tear up and you have to put six or eight thousand into a unit, you have lost your profit for an entire year on that unit at least. Oh, yeah. Your profit. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. So absolutely. So, I yeah, hate we'll, to we'll lose talk. money. I may not only make money, but boy, I don't want to lose money. 
So you run a very tight ship and I appreciate any advice that you can give me. So, all right, well, you do great. So I'm, I'm going to turn it back over learning. one more question and then over to James and I'm going to mute myself again. Anybody else? We'll start the single family part here and turn it over to Jane and Sharon in about five or six minutes or so. Um, any other questions though? Anybody have? All right, you know, I'm, I'm on, I, I like ice breaking. I mean, I hate awkward silence. So um, let's do this. So, um, so James, I've shared my story with James a few times. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm actually invested across the country, right? Las Vegas, Georgia, some in Florida, um, but I'm, I live in Washington, well, Upper Marlboro, Maryland, right? The DMV, like everyone here. And I've never been able to crack the code on how to buy here. So what what is your advice? Um, you bought your first property in, I think you said, uh, Charles County. So what was, what's your advice in terms of, uh, let's say, if you were to really reapproach trying to buy in this market, opposed to other places that are a little bit more favorable or uh, termed as favor favorable for multifamily? Um, so I want to talk to you because I, the only time I bought, quote unquote, not here, it was a disaster. <laughs> so we should, we, we should sit down offline and talk one of these days and have, have a whiskey or a scotch and have a whiskey with an EY and with a Y and there you go. Yeah. There you go. Um, I, I got, for me, it was almost like out of necessity. I feel like I got so burned by like not being able to send my own contractors and stuff like that to a property and like watch it that I was like, okay, I'm only buying stuff where I can easily drive to it within like an hour, hour, 20 minutes or whatever. Um, I mean, Prince George's County is expensive right now. I, I saw some deals in PG, like I saw some multifamily deals get sold for like, like 400,000 for like an 11 unit um, back in when the market crashed, but I haven't seen much. Um, same thing with like, and Arundel County, you know, the deal, the, the stuff that I'm seeing now, um, I mean, the, the places that I bought uh, were, it was all off market, but it was Charles County, St. Mary's County, and Baltimore County. Um, and I think those counties, you don't have as much competition. Prince George's, I feel like you didn't you used to have as much competition. And then it got, it got super hot. Um, so, I mean, I don't know. I think, I think off market, you can still find deals. You could always find, you know, if you look off market, you would always find sellers that just want to get out. They're tired of it. They want to retire or whatever, or, you know, somebody passed away or whatnot. They just don't want to deal with it. But I want to talk to you about how you bought in other places and made it work. Cause when I try to do it, it didn't work and obviously you do it and Nicole does it and James does it. And I, I think like I have a mental block for that. So I want to learn from you guys. Um, no, I, I'm, I'm, open. I'm sure we all have different perspectives, but yeah, I'll definitely tell you as much as I can about, you know, like how it worked for me and, and it, you know, I want to, but obviously, you know, I've, I've bought there, but I want to, I want to own here so I can yeah. you know, like put hand, you know, yeah, and yeah. just actually have a little, you, you, know, you, gotta, you gotta look. You gotta look off market, and you gotta just hit people up. You're, you, 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 I feel like you know how to talk to people, so just you know, it's the same. Oh, oh yeah, it's the All same right, cool. as. Uh, you know, you'll get some haters, and you'll get some. You know, it's like dating. <laughs> Broker dating, solo dating. I got it. <laughs> no thanks, Alex. No great advice. We'll appreciate definitely... you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's James, do you much. want to share how we how they can um, um, get to the recordings of this and if they have questions and stuff? Sure. So, so um, I guess a couple of things for you here. So, um, number one, Alex, thank you so much, man. That was phenomenal. No, thank you guys thank for, you for, for you know, allowing me to blabber about the limited knowledge that i got from you guys the little bit of knowledge that i got i mean i i learned probably five percent of what you know and then it it turned into good results so i wish i could make it to the thing on in march you will uh we'll dial you in from uh from columbia okay um so i guess a couple of things for you guys so 
in the class that that obviously um, Alex has referenced many times and I have referenced and Jan and Sharon have been there and stuff like that is in March in Baltimore. Um, it is four days. <clears throat> we have not done a live class in forever. So this is kind of a one shot deal. The nice thing about it is that um, it also comes with the online class um, uh, and they basically follow each other. So if you can only make it Saturday and Sunday, you get the online part, you can watch that and then just come on Saturday, Sunday, whatever you choose to do. But we'll put this link, um, passivecapitalforlife.com forward slash events into the um, uh, the chat. And then all of these um, Teaching Tuesdays and our meetups and stuff like that are actually on our YouTube channel. So we'll put that in the chat as well. And then um, I'll put my email in there as well. If you guys have any questions about anything, you know, multifamily related, um, I'm usually pretty good about getting back to people within 24, 48 hours. Um, and again, we're always here to help you um, as much as we can. Um, and again, thank you, Alex. Nicole, did you want to close with anything? Thank you, guys. No, I just wanted to say to Alex that as much as he kind of doesn't give himself as much credit as I think he deserves is that he's, he's really a superstar. I mean, he's a superstar in, as a realtor, he's a superstar. As an investor, he's a superstar. As a human being, and I'm really proud to be able to call him my friend these days. Oh, you're sweet. I'm I'm just learning. I'm just trying to pick up a little bit tidbits here and there, and then if I if I can get to five percent of the success and the giving back and everything that you guys did, uh, you know that'll be a win. So I appreciate it. I appreciate you guys tremendously and thank you everybody for for hearing my, listening to my blabbering on and on to about. your very very good presentation there. <laughs> and <All right. laughs> no, no slides. No slides. Good job. No slides. No, no slides. slides. It's so funny before guys before everybody got on Michael's like, "Oh, uh, I made you a co-host uh for when you want to share your slides." I'm like, "Wait, Sli I'm supposed to have slides. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Sorry, guys. No slides. <laughs> I I probably have an open PowerPoint since like freaking high school or college. So it's been a good 20 plus years. So you just get you hop yeah. on AI and it does it for you. I did a, a slide deck that way a couple of weeks ago or whatever it was. It was actually pretty easy, but. You're, you're probably more tech savvy than I am. I, I don't yeah, know. I know. Not really, but I don't even know what I would put in my slides. What would I put in my slides? Uh, I don't know. You, put... had, you had slides when you did the meetup, didn't you? You brought your computer. I I, I bring my computer. Oh, you sometimes. brought spreadsheets. I think is what it was. When you did maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably yeah. Maybe, I like my spreadsheets. I like my yeah, spreadsheets. spreadsheets. I love wrong. my spreadsheets. So, I love my know. spreadsheets. Um. All right. Well, listen, thank you very much, everybody. Again, um, the link for the class um, is on there. We encourage you to um, show up. Um, and then um, we'll also put the, um, oh, actually, the YouTube one is already up here, I think, right? Yeah. Thanks, uh, Sharon and, and Jane actually put it up there for us. So um, at this point, we're going to transition over to um, the Academy, which is the Virtual REI Academy, um, which is basically a bunch of... Um, very successful investors um, teach a bunch of different strategies, all kind of under one umbrella. I think there's 45 or 50 classes on there taught by about 14 or 15 different investors. And uh, Jane and Sharon kind of lead uh, that. They're phenomenal people. Um, I, I think uh, givers and good people attract other givers and good people. So, you know, we've got um, uh, some great friends with Alex and you guys and, and a bunch of other people. So, um, they've done over 100 deals. Um, they're very successful across, I think, 10 states uh, right now. Um, and they're just really, really good at what they do. So I'm going to turn it over to you guys. Thank you, James. Awesome. Thank you. For Thank you, guys. I'm, I'm going to jump off and put my kids to bed, but I appreciate everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, right, man. Sounds good. Thanks. All right. See Talk you later. Thank, Thank you very much. much. All right. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Thank Sharon you. and James, I, I, I wish I, I wish I could stay for, for your presentation, but these kids have to be in bed by eight. So I got to uh, I got to hustle. No worries. We're, we'll Otherwise, catch it's next a disaster time. tomorrow morning. <laughs> Understood. All right. See you guys. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.